Hi, I'm Yolanda Lattimore, editor of DryerBuzz.com. I'm the buzz, but you're about to get the buzz behind the buzz at DryerBuzz.com. Follow the buzz as we're living Atlanta style, bringing you the culture of the city and more. We had a wonderful chance to hang out with Pearl Cleek as she introduced her new play, What I Learned in Paris, which is coming to the Alliance Theater. Don't take my word for it. Get the buzz behind the buzz. Watch and spread the buzz. One of the things that's really important to me is to be able to talk to younger women about the things that I've learned. Not because I think I know everything and can tell them what to do. When I was very young, nobody could tell me what to do. Almost nobody. My dad always could. But the whole idea of being able to pass on information is very important to me. Because if we struggle, 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 but don't find a way to communicate that to other people who are coming after, who don't really know what that struggle was, then we lose all of that. Rather than finding a way to say, this is what I know, and let me tell you what I know, and then you can do with it what you will. Um, so I want to just read you the um, short monologue that, uh, that Evie has, um, passing on her information about what she learned in Paris. This is Evie. I thought I was going to disappear once. I thought if I kept doing what I was doing, I would fade away a little bit more and a little bit more, until anybody who wanted to could look right through me. I was miserable. Barbara had gone off to college in Berkeley and all anybody around here ever talked about was politics. I would look at JP and wonder who he was and who I was. So I made him promise that right after the swearing in he would go with me to Paris for a week. We had never been and I thought it would be an adventure for us to share, a chance to reconnect. I saved up the money, got the tickets, booked us a wonderful room at a beautiful hotel and lost 15 pounds. I was counting down the days like they do in the movies, where the prisoner marks off his sentence on the wall. That was me. Then two days before we were scheduled to depart, the city sanitation workers decided to go out on strike. I was beside myself. I told JP I was going to Paris, and if he wanted to join me, his ticket would be on the kitchen table, and I left all by myself. I thought at first I'd be scared, but I was too mad to be scared. I was mad all the way to New York. I was mad when I changed planes for Paris. I was mad all the way across the Atlantic Ocean and mad when we landed at Charles de Gaulle Airport. I was mad when I got to the hotel, mad when I ordered dinner in my room. I was even mad when I took a walk and spotted the Eiffel Tower in the distance. Mad when I went to bed and mad when I woke up and went downstairs to the cafe for coffee and a croissant. If I wasn't the maddest woman in Paris, I was surely in the top five. I remember waking up and being so mad that JP wasn't there with me that I almost packed my things and flew back home, but I refused to give him the satisfaction. So I sat there, imagining him back in Atlanta, plotting and planning all day and all night, and realized there I was, in one of the most amazing cities in the world, being mad and miserable. Then all of a sudden, there was some kind of commotion at the end of the street. People were craning their necks to see what was going on, so I stood up too, and there were five of the most beautiful women I had ever seen. They were all very tall and very thin, impossibly graceful and improbably brown. They were wearing capes and boots, and skirts slid all the way up to there. They looked like a flock of birds or a band of angels, and I couldn't take my eyes off them. There was a photographer following along, snapping pictures and trying not to get in their way, but they didn't even seem to notice. They had their arms linked together and they were chanting something I didn't understand. What are they saying? I asked the woman at the next table. She grinned at me and translated. Boredom, she said, opening her arms wide as if to embrace the idea. Boredom is counter-revolutionary. Well, I was tired of being bored, or angry, or confused, or invisible, or whatever else I had become, so I paid for my breakfast and hurried out to see if I could catch them. I was in luck. There they were, posing in the park. The photographer was still snapping pictures, and they were pretending to be having a political rally or something, but I got closer and realized that between takes, they were speaking English. They were Americans. So I went up and introduced myself. They were New York City, born and bred, in Paris to do the first international fashion shoot for Essence magazine and causing a sensation everywhere they went. Yeah. We talked for a few minutes and then they had to get back to work, but I didn't want to let them go. 
Of course I had seen beautiful black women before, but I had never seen them walking like these women were walking, proud and strong and free. They were drinking deep of all that life in Paris had to offer, their every step a celebration. I followed them around all day. When they finally went back to their hotel, I headed back to mine, but I wanted to hang on to the feeling that I had watching them, so I stopped in a small cafe and ordered a glass of red wine. The waiter brought it, I said, Merci, took a sip and looked around. And across the room there was another beautiful woman, sitting all alone, also drinking a glass of red wine. And her eyes were shining, and her hair was wild, and she was so absolutely confident that she was exactly where she was supposed to be that I gasped. And do you know why? Because, my darlings, it was a mirror. I was already the woman I was longing to be. I was already alive in the world, blazing with my own spark of divine fire. That's when I understood that sometimes, when you're very lucky, life gives you a chance to look your true self right in the face. And when that happens, you don't have to explain it. All you have to say is yes. So that's easy. The play is not the play until you present it to the audience that comes to see it. And that's very different than a novel. A novel, you hope people get it. You hope that they think that joke you put in chapter three is funny. With a play, many playwrights, and I do this, we sit in the very back of the theater, so if it's not going good, you can tip out the door and nobody knows that you were there. If it goes great, you get to see and have the experience of a group of people responding the way you hope they would, sitting in your little office all by yourself, trying to say, what would this woman say? What would this man say? When it goes well, you get to hear people laugh if that joke works at the top of Act Two. You get to hear them gasp when a surprise is revealed. You get to actually see them cry if you do it right and something touches them in some way. And there's no other kind of writing that does that. Only the theater lets the writer have the experience of actually being with the people while they experience the work. Well, thank you. That takes place like, as that line um, moves forward. And they, I was in residence at Spelman at the time, and they did it there. And it was such a great experience um, for me that I remembered how much I was missing theater. So then I started writing plays again. Um, but I don't usually take uh, one to the other um, just because the forms are so different. Um, there is a, um, an effort now. Um, Aoka Chinzera, who is a, a wonderful filmmaker who is, uh, teaches at Spelman, um, is trying to make, um, actually is, is raising money at this very moment um, to try to bring some of my novels to the screen. She's a film director. So I hope that that will happen. Um, and she's got like, a website and a Facebook page and all that, and it's uh, Pro Play Film Park Project is what, it, what her thing is. And it's got interviews and you know updates about how she's doing and all that. So I, I hope that that will happen. Um, but the plays tend to stay the plays, and the books stay the books, and then if she makes a film, that would be that would be wonderful. Talking to me about making films, um, that I would definitely want to write the screenplay because I wanted to have that control and all that, which is really important. Because, you know, sometimes you read a book that you really love, and you go see the movie and say, what in the heck was that? That wasn't it. That wasn't what I thought. So there's always that. But I really um, trust Aoka. I mean, she's a friend. I know her. I know what she sees in the work is what I put in the work. So that writing for, um, for film is such a different way of doing things. Um, and I'm really not a person who thinks in pictures. You have to be visual to be a good filmmaker and to write a good film. And I, I hear the people talking. Um, even in a play, you know, it's like when I'm writing, it's kind of like everybody has on a black turtleneck, a black skirt, and they kind of come to the front of the stage and talk. And then I have to say to myself, okay, you can't just have a row of people talking. You've got to move them around. What are they doing? What are they thinking about? But in a film, the pictures and the images are so important that it would be a real um, change of the way that I process information and think about information. So since I do trust her and think she'll do, um, she'll do what I would have done if I was a screenwriter, I feel real comfortable with the fact that it'll be something different. I also respect um, Tom Wolfe, who was a writer who had several books that were turned into movies, and they would be great books, and the movies not so much. 
Um, and he said, I don't go see mine uh, when my novels are turned into movies. I don't go see it. I'm not responsible for that. That's not how I express myself artistically, so I don't do it. Now, I don't believe that. I think he snuck and looked at the movie. How you going to not look at the movie? Just to see. But I think that's his way of protecting himself from that, you know, where you don't have to say it. And I think, um, you know, there's a point where you have to really have faith in the work that you do as a writer and trust that it will find the people it's supposed to find in the way it's supposed to find them. Um, and if it does that, then, you know, let it go and, and hope that it does. <laughs> That's okay, I still want to say this. <laughs> I have two questions. One is, I was wondering what the, um, I guess inspiration was for the Fabulous Five and Just Want to Testify. Oh yeah, yeah, The Vampire. And vampire. My last uh, novel is called I Just Want to Testify. And it came about, it has five uh, female characters in it who are fashion models, but they're really vampires. Um, the reason that I, that I did that was that my daughter, um, who likes fashion, is find it um, you know, intriguing, gave me a copy of the uh, September issue of Vogue, which is like, you know, huge, it's like a book. So she said, oh, you need to look at this, this so beautiful clothes in here and all that stuff. So I had already been aware of the fact that vampires were all creeping into the popular culture. Um, you know, uh, that Twilight series with the boyfriend and the girl who can't get together because if he gets too excited, he'll suck her blood and all that. And I'm thinking, this is not good. You know, that's not a good boyfriend <laughs> where you've got to deal with stuff like that. Um, true blood, all those things. So when I looked at the, I was already aware of it. And then when I looked at the uh, Vogue, every single model, every single woman in there looked to be about six foot five. They weighed about 82 pounds. And they were pale as pale could be, bright red lipstick. And they had that eyeshadow like in the uh, ballerina movie, The Black Swan, with those eyes like that. And I said, every single one of these girls looks like a vampire. And then it was kind of funny to me. It was like, what if they really are vampires? And we're all putting them in the movies and putting them in the magazines and loving them. And they're really vampires. Now, I don't believe in vampires. But the thought occurred to me, what would it be like to drop five beautiful vampires into West End and see how Blue Hamilton would deal with it? And these particular vampires had made a deal with five undergraduates at Morehouse. And the deal was, we will pay for your whole education, but we can't reproduce by ourselves. They were displaced by Hurricane Katrina. So they had been living outside of New Orleans, and they had men who used to come and visit with them so they could continue their vampire group. But they only could have female babies, so they couldn't reproduce without men coming there. But after Katrina, the place where they had been was wiped out. So they were living on an island that was given to them by Angelina Jolie, who I think was <laughs> So they were living there and they needed men. So they made a deal with these guys from Morehouse. They'll pay everything and then they have to come to the Vampire Island afterward for five years and, and do all of that. Of course, these guys did not read the fine print, which said, at the end of the five years, we're going to kill you, bite your heads off, and you'll be gone. So they come to Blue Hamilton at the beginning of the book and say, can you please help us? And the contract also says, these vampires are very smart, vampire women. And the contract says that the contract is null and void if, when it comes due, among these five young men, they can find one woman, not one apiece, one among them, who will speak up for them and say, this is a good man, don't take him. And none of these guys could find anyone who could do it because the vampires were offering 250 grand to say, take him. So that these men had all acted abominably toward the women in their lives. So when it came time to choose to say, hmm, should I say this guy who's treated me bad or take the 250,000? Everybody took the 250000 So they were going to have to go with the vampires, and that's why they came to Blue to ask for help. But it, it was fun to write about vampires. My editor, um, very nice woman in New York, my vampires have a way of controlling their desire for blood because they drink um, Bloody Marys. They can drink um, tomato juice, and then they don't want blood. They hate tomato juice, so they put vodka in it, so they're always drinking <laughs> Bloody Mary, and my, my editor called me and said, can vampires really do that? You know, would that, be, would that, would that work? And I said, there aren't any vampires. What do you mean? Can vampires really do it? Like there's a list of facts that you must have for the vampire playbook. I said, it's a made-up thing. These are, my vampires do it the same way other vampires do other things. Mine, you know, mine can do, as long as they got tomato juice, they're okay. They used to do red wine, but they developed an immunity to red wine, so now they had to go to, they had to go to but it was just kind of funny um, for me to work with vampires because I don't I don't tend to write 
you know, about vampire kinds of things. I mean, Blue Hamilton has had past lives, but as he reminds the vampires, having multiple lives is different from being the undead, you know, because they never die, and he dies and comes back and dies and comes back, which is good. So that was fun, but I'm not like starting a vampire series. Some people were mad at me, like, oh, how can you do that? I said, it's just a fiction oh. book. <laughs> Relax, it's just, you know, this is not, this is not a, um, I really believe the world works like this. This is just, just some fun. Yeah. But if you, um, have you read any of them? No. Because if you, if you start in order, when the first two were set in Iowa, Michigan, and then the others were all set in okay. um, So the first one kind of goes